uh, molecular genetic techniques. There are two strategies for relating the function, location, and structure of a gene product. Um, there is the gene strategy, um, which in the classical model, uh, you isolate a mutant or, uh, organism that has a defect in some process or some visual phenotype that you're interested in. Um, and you isolate uh, the mutated gene from a DNA library, um, so you screen uh, a library of all the genes that organism has um, and then you from there have a cloned uh, gene and you put that into uh, E. coli or something an expression uh, a cell culture or something that will um, make that protein for you um, and then <clears throat> you can analyze just that one protein instead of all the proteins uh, in the uh, organism so um, the reverse strategy uh, is to first determine the protein coding sequence. Um, so we start with the actual protein, and then uh, we search a database to identify that protein coding sequence, and then we use PCR to isolate just that gene. So um, we can look up the flanking regions, uh, or we can we can do um, some fancy different types of PCR to get the flanking regions. Um, but uh, once we have that sequence, <clears throat> we can then uh, use uh, PCR to get multiple copies of it. Um, we can do uh, cloning, so we have uh, copies uh, saved up, uh, so to speak, so we can work with them. And then we can work on gene isolation, so we can do uh, tDNA, tDNA insertion, um, or target mutagenesis um, to turn that gene off, and then we can look at how that affects the organism. So we can either start with a naturally occurring uh, on the left-hand side here um, to a naturally occurring phenotype that we want to analyze, or we can start with a protein um, and then work backwards to the mutant. So uh, just a quick uh, reminder on uh, dominant and recessive um, genes and how they affect uh, the phenotype. <clears throat> so wild type, we have our uh, two copies of the normal genes. We have the normal phenotype, the wild type phenotype. Uh, if the gene is dominant, then all you need is one copy uh, of that mutation to make the mutant. Um, and if you have two copies, you also see the mutant. Um, but if it's recessive, if you have one copy, um, that uh, wild type gene is haplosufficient, so it's able to still produce the wild type phenotype, while you need two recessive copies and there's nothing to cover up that broken gene, and you will see the mutant phenotype. Briefly go over um, the two types of cell division, mitotic and meiotic. Um, so we need to know these things because we need to know how mutations are passed on from generation to generation. So mitotic cell division is um, in when cells are just duplicating themselves in your body. Um, this is not anything to do with sexual reproduction. You have a, um, a parental and a, or sorry, a paternal and a maternal copy of each chromosome since uh, humans are diploid. Um, the cells will then uh, replicate the chromosomes, they will, the spindle fibers will come and pull apart the sister chromatids, and then we have cell division, and what we end up with is just two copies of the exact same cell. Now, uh, meiosis is different. So both, uh, or each replicated chromosome pairs uh, undergo homologous crossing over, and that's really important in this. So we start with a um, mother and father parental uh, or paternal and maternal copy of each chromosome. Uh, the chromosomes replicate and then we have uh, metaphase one where we pull apart the uh, actual pairs as opposed to pulling apart the sister chromatids. Then, <clears throat> And at this stage 
um, this is important. This is where crossing over happens. And so crossing over is exchanging small pieces of uh, chromosomes from your uh, uh, one pair to another, from your uh, maternal or uh, to your paternal or vice versa. Um, so as you can see, uh, it's kind of small in this diagram, but as you can see, um, they've exchanged a little bit of uh, the uh, uh, bottom of these chromosomes. So you can see there's a little blue on the red chromosome, a little red on the blue chromosome. Um, and then in uh, metaphase two, those sister chromatids are pulled apart. So we have uh, the result is four 1N haploid copy of each chromosome, but each of those chromosomes could also have crossing over occurring. Um, and so this is another way to shuffle up um, uh, genetic material in addition to this uh, uh, Mendel's uh, law of equal segregation. Um, <clears throat> it's important too that in sexual reproduction that we end up with 1N chromosomes because if we were like using a mitotic division where we would end each cycle with 2N, then during sexual reproduction where we combined the, the chromosome uh, or genome of two parents, then every generation the genetic material would double and that's not what we want. So we have to uh, cut it in half and then recombine it to one through sexual reproduction. Um, so that's a brief reminder of how uh, mitosis and uh, meiosis works. So the reason that we need to talk about meiosis is so we can talk about how these mutations segregate and are passed from generation to generation. So if we have an individual that is homozygous for a dominant mutation, big A, big A, in the wild type, the recessive gene, small a, small a, um, if they were to have gametes, so sperm or egg, depending on, it doesn't matter which individual is which at this point. Um, so for the mutant individual, all of their gametes would be have that dominant mutation. And for the wild type individual, all of the gametes would have the recessive wild type. So when those gametes combine to have offspring in the F1, which is the first filial generation, they are all heterozygous. And because this is a dominant mutation, you can see that all of them are yellow because they all have that, uh, that phenotype of the dominant mutation. Now, if two heterozygous individuals from that generation were to have gametes, because they're heterozygous, you have a 50-50 shot of having either the uh, dominant mutation or the recessive wild type for both individuals. And you end up with, if they were to, uh, to cross, a three to one ratio where you have three individuals with that dominant uh, mutation and one individual um, that's recessive. And so uh, as a reminder, ooh, this is gonna be rough. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for my art, uh, but the Punnett square here. Um, so the each individual is, you can either get a big A, small A from, uh, we'll make this over here, uh, father, and we'll make this over here, mother. So with our Punnett square, when we set it up, you have big A, big A, big A, small A, big A, small A, small A, small A. Now, because of that, if you have, since it's dominant, if you have only one copy of the big A, you show the dominant mutant phenotype. So those three are mutants, and then the doubly recessive, uh, homozygous recessive here, is normal. That wasn't as bad. My art uh, drawing with a mouse is not my forte, but that actually looks pretty good. I'm pretty proud of myself. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, segregation of a recessive mutation quick. Um, so in this case, uh, you have to have two copies of the recessive allele to be a mutant um, and the wild type is actually dominant um, and so from there all the gametes of this first individual um, are contain the mutant allele and for the wild type uh, individual all the uh, gametes contain the uh, dominant wild type 
So the first filial generation is heterozygous again, so it's got one copy of the dominant, one copy of the recessive, but since this mutation is recessive, we see that there's no change in phenotype. It doesn't look like a mutant. Um, and, uh, and when we talk about humans, sometimes we talk about carriers for diseases. So this person would be a carrier because they don't show the phenotype, but they have a gene that can lead to that disease. So if these homozygous or heterozygous individuals uh, were to reproduce, their gametes would be either uh, a big B uh, dominant or a small B mutant um, for both of them. And then if we were to do the same Punnett square um, as before, here we go again. All right. Ugh, still not great. E, e. And so we're crossing two heterozygotes again. Big A, big A. We get big A, big A, big A, little A, big A, little A, little A, little A. We'll make this the male and we'll make this the female. So the only difference here is that instead, because the gene is recessive, you need two copies of it to show the mutant phenotype. So our recessive or mutant would be down here. That is the little a, little a's. And then all of anyone that has a copy of the normal wild type gene, these three squares up here are going to be blue for normal phenotype. So if we want to know how genes of interest uh, interact with one another, for uh, example, in a pathway, uh, we can do studies with double mutants. And so uh, in our first example here, we have uh, a mutation in gene A, and that leads to the accumulation of some uh, intermediate product number one. Um, we, if we look at a gene B, that leads to a accumulation in a different intermediate product. Now, if we do a double mutation where the organism has a mutation in A and B, then there is an, also an accumulation of intermediate one. So our interpretation from that is that the reaction catalyzed by gene A needs to happen in order for there to be an intermediate for gene B to catalyze. So if you break both of them, there's none of number two, intermediate two, for B to process to become the final product. So we know that gene A, because of the double mutation, is upstream of gene B. So now if we were to look at uh, a signaling pathway instead of a biosynthetic pathway, we have a mutation in gene A, uh, a represses our reporter expression. So this can be a GFP, it can be a LAC, uh, gene, something that gives a phenotype that we're, we're trying to determine uh, how it is regulated. Uh, a mutation in gene B gives constitutive reporter expression. That means that uh, it's always on. So a reporter never gets turned off. It's just constantly running uh, 100%. So uh, if we have a double mutant, um, that gives repressed reporter expression. And so what we would take from that is a positively, or A, positively regulates reporter expression and is negatively re uh, regulated by B, right? So uh, A is what's responsible for turning on our reporter and B is what stops A from working and so if you were to break both of those, then there is nothing, there's no A to turn on the gene. And so we see no reporter expression. So in this case, A would be kind of an inducer of gene expression, while B would be a repressor. So uh, in our last example here, we have a double mutation in A and B, and that gives constitutive uh, reporter expression. So it's always on. 
Um, and so in this case, that doubling mutation, uh, the interpre uh, interpretation would be that B is a repressor. It negatively regulates reporter expression and A regulates B. So A says, okay, B, you can stop expression or you can start expression. Um, but since both of them are gone, then the natural state of this gene is to just be on and B's job is to turn it off. So we would see that there is constitutive reporter expression, meaning that this, those A and B are two genes that work together to turn off that gene. All right, so let's quickly talk about suppression and synthetic uh, lethality. And so uh, for suppression, we have an observation that uh, mutations in gene A and B each have a mutant phenotype but the double mutant uh, has a wild type phenotype. And so how we would interpret this uh, through suppression is that uh, the function of each protein depends on the interaction with the other. So in the wild type, you can see here that are kind of these cartoonish binding sites. We have a square binding site in A and then kind of the cutout of that square uh, for B and that they fit well together. But if we have a mutation in A at the binding site, we've changed uh, the conformation to this triangle and therefore it won't dimerize to make a functional protein. If we leave a wild type and we have a mutation in B that changes it to that triangle shape but we still have the square in the wild type they won't fit together but we can have a double mutation where both the binding site on A and the binding site on B both change to this triangle conformation and we get the wild type function again. So for synthetic, uh, synthetic lethality one, uh, our observation is that a double mutant has a more severe phenotype uh, defect than the corresponding single mutant. And so our interpretation from this would be that the two proteins are part of kind of a, a heterodimer, so they are required to work together. You need two halves to make a whole, and they interact uh, to function normally. So in this case, uh, as you can see here, we have our perfect conformation where they're kind of reciprocals of each other, right? So you can kind of flip them over and they uh, match uh, either way. And they work fine when they're both wild type. Um, but if you have a mutation in A, there is enough of a uh, complementation there that it will still continue to work. Um, and the same thing with B, while it's not uh, functioning 100% uh, and so they're not bound really uh, stuck together very well, um, they still will work well enough to have the wild type. Um, but then if you mutate both of them, there's no way those two can fit together, and therefore we have a severe uh, defect. Um, and then if we look at uh, synthetic lethality two, our observation is that a double mutant is not viable, but the corresponding single mutants have the wild type pheno phenotype. And so this is just another version of, uh, or the exact same phenotype we saw in synthetic, uh, synthetic lethality one, but we have a different explanation or interpretation. And so um, the interpretation for the second one is that the two proteins function in redundant pathways um, that, that assemble some um, essential product. And this ha can happen quite a bit because there's a lot of uh, genome, whole genome duplications and things of that nature uh, in higher organisms. And so if we were to look at the wild type, we see that we have some precursor, say this is a sugar and some sort of metabolism pathway. And then gene A makes this final product, this blue circle, and gene B does the exact same job to make that final circle. Um, and so if you were to mutate A, we still have gene B doing the job to make that blue circle. And if you were to mutate gene B and stop its function, you still have A doing it. But then once you mutate both of them, there's no gene or enzyme left to make that final product. And so you get the mutant phenotype in that case. You want to study a gene, including the sequence, um, the protein it might make, 
etc., we can use recombinant DNA uh, technology. And so uh, this is also um, can be known as cloning. Um, so the way this works is you take a vector, which is like a plasmid uh, DNA or something to carry the gene of interest um, that you are looking at. And then you combine that DNA fragment. It can be just a piece of DNA or it could be a gene. It could be uh, from cDNA, so it has the introns removed. It could be from gDNA or genomic DNA. It could have introns in it, etc. So you combine those together and we call that uh, recombinant DNA. So we recombine a vector and from a bacteria um, and DNA from your organism of interest. Then we can take that vector with our gene of interest in it and we can put it back into bacteria or yeast or something of that nature. Um, generally, um, there I think the, probably the most widely used thing is uh, DH5-alpha, which is an E. coli strain. Um, that's what I'm most familiar with, and that's what I see the most. Um, but you can also um, um, put things in yeast. The problem with uh, if you're trying to express these recombinant things in E. coli is if you know um, from uh, transcription in prokaryotes, there's no intron splicing, right? So if you have genomic DNA and you try to express that gene in bacteria, you're going to have a problem because it's going to include all those introns. Um, so then you would do something like yeast. But if you've pre-spliced them out by using cDNA, you should be okay with E. coli. Um, but once we clone them, so every time those, uh, those E. coli replicate, then they're replicating our gene too. So we grow up a whole bunch of E. coli. Then we can use um, some DNA extraction techniques to isolate all those uh, recombinant DNA vectors, and then we can cut out our gene of interest, um, etc. DNA that uh, we've cloned in those vectors, we can't physically do that, right? We can't DNA is so small, you can't just take scissors. Um, so we do um, rest restriction enzyme digests, and what that is is we take these enzymes that we've isolated from um, bacteria and we we characterize them and we know exactly what pattern they cut in. So for in this example we're using ECOR1 um, and every time we introduce ECOR1 with the right uh, environmental conditions to DNA, it's going to cut the same pattern. It's going to recognize this GAATTC pattern, and it's always going to cut between the G and the A on the 5 to 3 prime side, and the G and the A on the, uh, five, the opposing side, the anti-parallel side. And so what happens then is we get what's called sticky ends. So as you can see, there is a uh, five prime overhang, right? So this is the three prime side, and then here's the five prime side, and it's overhanging. And here we have the three prime side on this side, and the five prime side overhanging here. And so we end up with this four bases of five prime uh, overhang that are complementary to each other. And we call these sticky ends because they have an overhang. So if they find another piece of DNA that complements them, the AA, uh, or the TTAA overhang, it's going to stick to that. And that makes um, cutting out pieces and putting them back in easy if you can match up those sticky ends. So uh, here is uh, just a table of some examples of these restriction enzymes. Um, these are some of the more common ones. Um, except I'm not familiar with uh, South 3 a one I've never used that one, but um, BAMH1, EcoR1, um, uh, HIND3, um, uh, NOT1, those are fairly commonly used. Um, and uh, this will show you here, uh, we have the overhang sites, as you can see, um, like that for each of these things. And as you notice, they all have different recognition sites. So they recognize different combinations of nucleotides and different lengths. So uh, SAW3A1 only needs four nucleotides to cut, while ECOR1 needs six. 
um, and not one needs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, to recognize and cut. So uh, there's these giant tables of these enzymes. There's tons and tons of them. So there's really a different enzyme uh, for every purpose, right? Or for every piece of DNA. If you want to cut somewhere, there's likely an enzyme uh, for you to be able to cut that out. Uh, one more thing I want to point out from this table is uh, these are all sticky ends except for uh, small one, and that's probably why I've never used uh, uh, small one. So small one makes blunt ends, and what that means is instead of having overhangs, it just cuts. So there's this, you know, uh, straight line. There's no overhang three prime or five prime overhang. And you might think, oh, that's nice and, and uh, neat. Well, the problem is if you want to recombine DNA, um, not having sticky ends makes it really difficult to do what we call blunt end ligations, which means taking two blunt pieces of DNA and matching them up. Because there's no attractive force of those hydrogen bonds like we see with the sticky ends, you get very reduced efficiency. Um, and so sometimes you have to use blunt ends because there's no, uh, like I said, there's a giant table of enzymes. Sometimes there's just not the one you need. The sequence does not have a known restriction enzyme to cut how you want it, so you have to use blunt ends. Um, so know that blunt ends are, they're nice because you don't have to worry about matching things up um, with, with your overhangs, but they're very low efficiency for recombining things. So another thing that these uh, sticky ends allow for is to make sure that the right piece of DNA is what is actually being incorporated into your vector. Um, so in this example here, we have our vector that we've digested with one of those restriction enzymes, and we have a TTAA overhang um, and with the phosphate group on the end, and uh, this is just the uh, um, hydroxide group that is present uh, after you cut. So don't worry about those really. But notice this uh, this TTAA overhang. And so in our uh, reaction mixture, we have three genomic DNA fragments uh, that were cut out. We have A, B, and C. And if you were to put this vector in that reaction mix that's been uh, everything being cut already, then you notice that the only one that can really ligate based on those sticky ends is A, because it has the complement of AATT to actually ligate uh, to that vector. And because B has the CG uh, five prime overhang and uh, C has this AGCT, those don't match up with the vectors overhang. And so it'll uh, specifically pick or stick with the overhang uh, that we're looking for. So it's, so you can be very specific with what you want to uh, glue into place, so to speak. And so um, once we proceed and add the vector, we have our two lig ligated pieces, and then we have those uh, unpaired fragments that didn't have anywhere to go. And then um, there, as you can see here, we have this phosphate group and this hydroxyl group, and there's no black line there on either side, right? And so even though those hydrogen bonds stick stuff into place, we still need to use T4 DNA ligase um, along with ATP uh, to, for energy for this, uh, this reaction. And that fills in the DNA backbone between the newly ligated pairs. Um, so the hydrogen bonds will get you uh, everything stuck in place, but you still need to fix that backbone with DNA ligase. So this is a kind of a generic uh, view of a plasmid cloning vector. Um, and so uh, as you can see here, we have um, this polylinker site where we have a whole bunch of different um, known restriction enzyme sites. So those are um, detailed sites that we know if we add uh, hind three, it's gonna cut at the very top of this polylinker site. And if we, uh, at ECOR1, it's going to cut at the very bottom. So they've mapped these things so we know uh, what sites are there and uh, where they cut relative to each other. Um, so we can uh, easily uh, paste our, our interest, our gene of interest into this vector. Now, um, in addition, these plasmid cloning vectors have other things as well. Uh, this is the origin of replication. So that is 
um, the place that or the where the transcription machinery is going to start um, uh, making copies of your gene when you put it into E. coli, um, or, or excuse me, or uh, or replicating the plasmid that is, um, and then also there is uh, what we call a selective marker, and that what the selective marker is is it is a gene, in this case, AMP R stands for resistance to ampicillin, and ampicillin is an antibiotic. And so when we take this vector and put our gene in it, then we have to put it into uh, E. coli, for example, to make sure that we are making copies of it. And we don't want to put or we don't want to grow bacteria that didn't get that gene, right? So when we introduce this vector into E. coli, no process is 100% efficient. So there'll be a lot of them that took up our vector, our recombinant DNA, but there'll be a lot of E. coli that didn't get anything. They just didn't take anything up, whether um, there was not enough DNA or they just didn't have the right conditions. And so what we want to do is make sure that we only grow the E. coli that have our gene in it. And so having this ampicillin gene present on the vector allows us to grow this E. coli on a selective media such as ampicillin. And when we do that, all the uh, E. coli that did not get the construct, the vector, get killed. So that means that all we're growing in our ampicillin media is E. coli that have our gene of interest. So I put the cart before the horse uh, from that last slide a little bit here. So this is uh, going to explain it a little bit better. Uh, so we have our plasmid vector and we have our DNA uh, gene or piece of DNA that we want to clone. We then put that gene into the vector. Note that there is this ampicillin resist resistant gene here. Um, and so we then, there's different uh, ways that we can try to put this vector into E. coli. Um, you can use uh, calcium chloride uh, with uh, this heat, uh, heat shock to open up the cell membrane and allow the vectors to go in. Um, a more efficient way is what we call electroporation, and that is where we take media and our DNA and we run a very quick burst of electricity through the culture and that kind of allows the plasma membrane to dissociate and then associate right back again. And because that DNA is negatively charged, it'll get kind of pulled in uh, and then closes back up. Um, and it's a little more efficient um, than using uh, heat shock or calcium chloride or things of that nature. Anyways, um, so we get our, the, our uh, vector inside some of the E. coli, but as you notice, some of them do not take up that vector because there's no way you can be 100% efficient. Um, it's just not, not in the cards. <laughs> so um, we hope that we have high efficiency, but we do know that some of them are not going to take up uh, the, the vector. So then we plate stuff on an ampicillin plate. This probably should be right down here. So we plate stuff on an ampicillin plate, and so all these... Um, these cells here that have no vector, they die, right? They don't have the ampicillin resistant gene, so they die. And everything else that did get our vector is able to then be cultured and we can make tons and tons of copies of our gene of interest. So as I said earlier, um, if you are trying to express a gene or make that gene uh, or have that gene turn into a protein, um, there's an issue using bacteria when you're studying eukaryotic genes. And that issue is that bacteria don't take out introns, right? Um, only uh, uh, eukaryotes have introns that need to be spliced out. So one way to get around this is to uh, take the introns out before you put that gene into bacteria, and then you should get the protein that you are looking for. And so one way that we can do this is to create what we call cDNA. So the way this works is we isolate mRNA from our eukaryote of interest, whether it's human or dogs or whatever. Um, and 
we isolate the mRNA of the gene that we're looking at. And we use, remember mRNA is uh, single stranded and mRNA has that poly A tail on the three prime end. And so we add a poly T primer that will stick to that poly A tail. And then we use a uh, enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which will convert mRNA into a strand of DNA uh, which is opposite of transcription, right? So it's reverse transcription. Then we have a piece of RNA bound to a piece of DNA, and we can add a uh, alkali solution to break those two apart. And then we have template single-stranded cDNA, which we can add a uh, primer to and synthesize the complementary strand. And so now we've turned that mRNA into double-stranded DNA. And from there, uh, we can add uh, linkers or um, a lot of people create cDNA libraries where they just store this and then uh, they can um, work with that as raw material. Um, but in this figure, we're gonna keep going. Uh, so we can ligate linkers onto the end. Uh, these are blunt end ligations that allow us to add restriction sites. Um, and from there, we can then insert this by using those ECOR1 restriction sites into a vector and uh, express uh, the uh, protein that we're looking for. Okay, the next couple slides are about DNA sequencing. Um, I've posted on Moodle a uh, video produced by Illumina um, who makes the sequencers uh, that explain it much more clearly than I can with these static images because they actually have animations and, and stuff like that. So um, for the DNA sequencing, please make sure you watch that video. It's like four or five minutes. Um, it's a little advertisey um, because they're trying to get people to buy their stuff, but it's a very good informative video. As stated earlier, uh, we can use E. coli uh, to not only clone genes, but we can actually put constructs in the E. coli uh, that make the final protein product. And so uh, one way of doing this is putting this under a uh, promoter that we can uh, stimulate or turn on or off. And so in this example here, we have the LAC promoter, which is for lactose uh, metabolism. And um, we also have the LAC gene, and the LAC gene makes uh, beta-galactosidase. So when we add a um, lactose uh, alternative or a, a lactose analog, uh, which is IPTG, that causes this promoter to be stimulated and to allow RNA polymerase to uh, transcribe this LAC gene and then the ribosome within the uh, uh, E. coli will make beta-galactosidase. So we can harness this uh, for our own purposes. So if we take that same plasmid vector that has that LAC operon, and we use those restriction enzymes that we talked about previously, and we cut out the LAC Z gene, the beta-galactosidase gene, we don't care about that. Um, and instead, we put a gene of our interest. And in their example here, uh, we are putting in um, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, uh, which is a granulocyte colonating stimulating, colony stimulating factor, GCSF right there. Um, so we put that in the place of the laxy gene, but it's important that we keep that promoter there. So then, we, just like before, we transform uh, these uh, E. coli cells and put our construct into the E. coli cells. And now we have an inducible construct in these cells. So normally, without uh, that lactose analog, that plasmid just sits there. It doesn't do anything. There's no need uh, for that lac promoter to make a gene or be activated because there's no 
lactose or the analog around. So, but we can stimulate the production of our protein by using this if we introduce IPTG. So that promoter is going to sense the IPTG, allow for transcription with RNA polymerase, and then production of our GCSF. And so this is uh, commonly used uh, for producing things like insulin and growth hormone and other human proteins that are used for human uh, for therapeutic uses. So in addition to uh, putting these constructs into E. coli, we can also put these constructs into plant and animal cells uh, with different uh, results. So uh, many proteins have uh, native characteristics uh, only if they are uh, synthesized and processed in animal cells. Um, I already explained the problem with uh, using uh, prokaryotes is that there's no uh, there's no splicing, alternative splicing, removal of introns, um, folding is different, it's just a different environment. So it works for some things, but it's not per the perfect uh, place to express a gene. Um, so there are two common methods for transfecting animal cells, and they differ in whether they, uh, the vector is integrated into the host genome, um, or if it is uh, just kind of hanging out in the nucleus, but not integrated into the genomic DNA. Um, and so the first type here, A, is a transient transfection. And so a plasmid vector containing uh, a viral uh, origin of replication um, that is inserted into a cell, but because that vector is sitting there in the nucleus and the eukaryotic animal cell doesn't have uh, anything to recognize this viral origin of replication or anything. It doesn't have the machinery to understand how to use what it thinks is bacterial DNA. That means that it's not being replicated. And so every time this cell splits, it, both daughter cells don't get that vector, right? Because there's nothing there to to replicate it. So uh, what happens then is over generations or uh, multiple cell divisions, fewer and fewer of these cells have the recombinant DNA in it. So alternatively, a way to actually remedy that uh, problem situation is to incorporate our gene into the host genome. And if we do that, then the eukaryotic replication machinery will replic replicate the entire genome, including that gene that we put inside there. So as you can see in the picture here, we just have the circular um, vector floating around in the nucleus and it's making proteins, but it's not being replicated with every cell division. Um, so in this bottom, you can see here that we're gonna try to actually include that gene into the host's genome. And so uh, one way that we can do this is to, um, have a selectable marker where we transfect our animal cells with uh, electroporation, for example, and then we grow them on a media that has our selecti uh, select selectable marker, excuse me. Um, and our marker here is neomycin resistance. Um, so we have a media that is a G418, and that will get rid of any cells that don't have that vector. So it will get rid of cells uh, such as this that are um, no longer, or during replication, didn't get a daughter cell or didn't get a vector because they're a daughter cell. Um, and what we'll do is let generation after generation occur, only selecting for individuals that have that uh, gene of interest integrated into the genome. And by doing this, eventually, we will get one of these individuals that has integrated the gene through recombination into their own genome. And then that's a stable transformant in that from now on, whenever it replicates its genome, it's gonna replicate the gene we inserted as well. Now, what if we wanna know where a protein Goes. So we've been working on cloning this gene, we know the sequence, we can express the protein in a bacteria, etc. Um, but we want to know where it is located naturally 
within an organism. And so what we can do is we can use fluorescent proteins uh, to facilitate the cellular localization uh, from cloned genes. So hybrid sequence can be constructed that include or that encode, excuse me, uh, chimeric target proteins. Um, so what we're doing is taking a fluorescent protein such as GFP, which is something that naturally occurs in jellyfish. Um, it's kind of like a luciferase that you'd see in a firefly, um, but it is um, uh, stimulated by um, an excitation uh, wavelength so we can uh, tell it when to fluoresce. So uh, in this example here, they have a C. elegans um, that has ODR10 um, uh, protein that is fused with a GFP. And so then when we put it under a fluorescent microscope and we excite that uh, GFP with our excitation frequency, we get fluorescing and because this GFP is physically attached to that ODR10 protein, we can see where exactly that protein is within this worm. So let's talk a little bit about human disease here. So there are three uh, kind of primary uh, inheritance patterns for a uh, single gene important for single gene diseases. Uh, one is autosomal, autosomal dominant, uh, and that an example of that is Huntington's disease. And so we have a father here that is an affected individual. He has one copy of the Huntington's uh, disease gene and uh, a wild type in the other. The mother has two wild type genes so for both males and females, um, this cross would result in half being affected and half not being affected. We also have autosomal recessive. Um, an example of this would be cystic fibrosis. Um, so here we have two parents, a male and a female, that are both carriers, so they don't express the gene but they uh, have it, they have the recessive copy of it. And so what happens is in their offspring then, we have a three to one ratio of non-affected to affected, although two of them we would consider carriers. So if we were to do this Punnett square uh, again here, do this, and we have, we'll have uh, big A be wild type and little a be the, uh, the, cyst or the cystic fibrosis gene. Um, so we have big A, little a, and so this will be the dad up here. This will be the mom on the side. Uh, we have big A, big A, who's the non-carrier. Then we have big A, little a, and big A, little a, and those two are both carriers. And then we have, lastly, little a, little a, and that is the affected individual who does not have a uh, dominant copy of the gene to mask that um, uh, phenotype. Excuse me. It's getting late. I'm stumbling over my words a little bit tonight. All right. Uh, and then lastly, we have X-linked recessive. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a, an example of this. And so this is... Um, not autosomal because it's on a sex gene, the X uh, chromosome, or sorry, it's on the X chromosome, sex chromosome. Um, and so we have a male individual that has, is wild type for uh, the non-DMD gene, and then he has a Y chromosome. Um, and then the female, the mom, has, is a carrier for DMD and has a wild type uh, as well. And so the offspring would have males who are affected, half of them are, and half of them are 50% probability that you'd be unaffected. Um, because these males are always going to get that Y chromosome from their dad. They have to, otherwise they'd be female.
Um, so they have a 50-50 shot of getting either um, this uh, DMD gene or the regular X uh, gene. And then females will receive, they have to receive one X from their dad, the wild type one. And then they also have a 50-50 shot of getting the DMD gene from their mother. However, because they had to get that wild type gene from their dad, or that wild type chromosome from their dad, that will always cover up a recessive mutation. So females can only be carriers in this uh, pedigree and they can't be affected by DMD. So for your reference here, here are some more examples of uh, autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, and X-linked recessive um, traits in humans. So another way we can look at how genes work in an organism is to break them. Uh, that's one thing that we do in my lab. Uh, we don't use this technique. We use uh, tDNA insertion lines, which is slightly different, but uh, we can actually target and break genes of interest um, using this method. And so uh, what this method does is say we have a yeast gene that we are interested in breaking. Now, uh, if we know the sequence of this gene, we can see that there are these 20 nucleotides on either side that we have the sequence of. So now we use that information to design primers for a selectable marker of our choice. So this is an antibiotic uh, gene. Um, in this case, it's canamycin. Um, and when we make the primers to do PCR on that canamycin, we make sure that the primer has this 20 nucleotide flanking region that we saw near our gene attached as an adapter on the end. So that way, when we do our PCR, we have this complex that it has our canamycin gene, but it also has those two flanking sequences that are perfectly identical to the flanking sequence of our target gene. Now, what we can do is we can transform, whether through electroporation or some other uh, the calcium chloride method, etc., we put that disruption construct that we made into the yeast cell. And um, as we talked about earlier, homologous recombination crossing over like it occurs during um, uh, meiosis, that is a natural process that is usually finds flanking regions between two chromosomes, but it will also do the same for our construct in a, uh, and a chromosome. So here we have crossing over that occurs between our flanking regions. And what we end up doing is replacing that target yeast gene with this canamycin gene. And so we've removed it from one of those two chromosomes. And then in yeast, we have the process of uh, sporulation where um, we have four spores that are haploid made um, that will eventually turn into full individuals. And with that, uh, we can look and see what the function of that gene was because we've replaced that gene and knocked it out. On top of this, we can select for, because we used the canamycin gene to knock out or replace that gene, that is our selectable marker. So after we do that transformation, we grow them on this G418 uh, media and pick only cells like these top two here that have been transformed with our uh, disruption complex or construct. Okay, so the next two slides um, from the textbook are about isolation of mouse um, uh, stem cells but I'm not a big fan of these figures. And so I'm actually going to just kind of skip these next two slides and actually use um, figures from my genetics lectures. Um, so bear with me. Um, you'll see that they're related. It's the same thing, just presented in, in slightly different uh, manner. <laughs> 
Okay, so this uh, is from the genetics, uh, my genetics course. It's the same thing, but I think they presented it a little bit better um, in, in the genetics textbook. Um, so we're going to look at how to produce embryonic stem cells uh, with a gene knockout in mice. And so in this example, we have a cloned gene. Um, we're going to add some things uh, to this gene uh, to create a construct. We're going to add uh, this uh, TK gene and we're also going to put a neomyosin gene in the middle of our exon 2 and then we're going to introduce them into mites. So when we're trying to insert this construct there are three different outcomes that can uh, happen. One is that we have that inserted uh, selectable marker inside our gene, exon 2, and when it gets inserted into the mouse, recombination occurs, and so then in the mouse's chromosome, we have that neomyosin gene inserted into the mouse's host chromosome, but we didn't insert the TK gene, and we didn't insert any of this uh, other yellow um, non-important DNA. So all we did was insert that neomyosin gene into the middle of that second exon. Now, another possible outcome is that we get a random insertion where, as you can see here, this entire construct gets inserted randomly somewhere in the chromosome. And that's not good uh, because if we're looking to see what the actual function of that gene is that we put the neomyosin into, if we insert randomly somewhere else, we could be breaking a different gene. And then we don't know, we'll see a phenotype and, and not know exactly um, if that is the result of the neomyosin insertion or if we inserted this vector randomly in say a glycolysis gene or something like that. And then the last thing that can happen is just no insertion, right? And so this construct is made to have selectable markers that allow us to find these two events and exclude cells that have those events in them. Now, remember our construct had two different selectable markers in it. It has neomyosin uh, and the neomyosin resistant genes, and then it had uh, that TK uh, gene. And that TK gene is selectable for um, constructs that have this uh, Ganke clover um, and so what we do then is we first culture those cells in neomyosin. So any cells that didn't have that neomyosin resistance gene, so the cells with no insertions, they die. We then add this uh, Ganka clover and that kills any cell that did have that pink TK gene. And so what we're left with then, after both of these uh, selection steps, is only cells that had that proper insertion of neomyosin into the gene in the right location through that recombination, and not cells that didn't get a copy of the gene, or cells that had that random insertion somewhere else in the genome. So now that we have some of these embryonic stem cells with this mutation, we want to see how that affects a mouse, an adult mouse, right? Because if we're looking at phenotypes, the phenotype of a stem cell really isn't going to tell us much uh, in the context of a, a large organism. So what we do is we take these embryonic stem cells and we take a blastocyst from a black female mouse. And we take those stem cells and inject them and it's important that these stem cells were from a homozygous brown mouse. So now we inject these cells into the blastocyst and we put that blastocyst back into the surrogate mother, the black mouse, and then we allow these embryos to develop and the mice to be born. And what happens is because this embryo is made up of some cells that are from a uh, brown mouse and then other cells that are from a 
uh, black mouse, what we have is what we call a chimeric mouse is born. And this chimeric mouse has stripes that are uh, black from the uh, host blastocyte or the uh, receiving blastocyte as well as brown parts from those embryonic stem cells that we put in there. So this is just a visual uh, confirmation of our experiment working. So we can look at the mice and not have to do any DNA or anything like that um, to see if our genes are there. We can visually see, look, this mouse that was from a uh, homozygous black uh, coated mother is a brown and black mouse. So it has to have some of those brown stem cells that we introduced. So then what we can do is we can take those chimeric mice and we can breed them to uh, homozygote, um, uh, either male or female, depending on if your chimeric male, uh, mouse was male or female. And what we should see is um, mice that are heterozygote. So half of the offspring should be heterozygote. And with those of dual heterozygotes, we can do what's called cis mating or sib mating, excuse me, um, and take any heterozygote mice and mate them together until, so it's kind of inbreeding, um, and we can then sequence the gene that we, that uh, neomycin gene and do PCR and sequencing to see if there's two copies of it or if there is um, a regular copy of that gene there as well. So this is a way that we can um, knock out a gene of interest, put it into mice, and then see what that phenotype is all about. So I really only hit on uh, some of the highlights from this chapter. This is a, uh, there's a lot of information on this chapter about techniques that can be used for genetic manipulation or genetic um, uh, characterization. Um, so if you are at all fuzzy on any of this or you want more information on other techniques that might be available, um, go to my YouTube channel, um, go to chapter 10 of my genetics course. Um, in that chapter, there's more on um, recombination mapping and um, uh, restriction enzyme digests and uh, cDNA synthesis and things of that nature. Um, so it might give you a little more of a, a, a full uh, appreciation for some of these things, PCR and, and things of that nature too. Um, so feel free to check that out. Um, and if you're cool or comfortable with uh, what we discussed today, then I'll see you in chapter seven.